Okay, um, we're going to do philosophy in 45 minutes, believe it or not. <laughs> and I'm Marianne Talbot, as you probably guessed. Um, and I've been asked to say something quickly about lifelong learning, and I'm very happy to do that because um, I was thrown out of school at 15. Some of you possibly know that, um, but others don't. I was thrown out of school at 15 for truancy and disruption. Um, <laughs> and I didn't come back into full-time education until I was 26. And when I was 26, I came back um, through the Open University, which, of course, deals, as we do, with um, people who are older than um, traditional undergraduates, and they were completely fantastic. And I was studying a foundation course, which of course was all I could do, given that I had no two O-levels to rub together. Um, and I got to the philosophy bit, and it was the hardest thing I had ever done. And I sat up all night trying to do this um, assignment, whatever it was. Uh, and in the morning I thought, wow, wow. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, I, it, I, I just fell in love with philosophy. And I went on, I did a year at the Open University, and then I went on to, do, to Bedford College at the University of London. And I was just walking on air. I absolutely adored it. Uh, and that's what lifelong learning is. It's never too late. And to illustrate that, my mum... Um, in the year of her 50th wedding anniversary, the year she was 70, she got herself a 2-1 from the uh, University of Manchester. Not in philosophy, she tried philosophy and she hated it. <laughs> Probably because I was on the phone to her saying, are you sure you've done this, are you sure you've done that? And she really was not into that. Um, but she absolutely loved studying later in life and she got herself a 2-1, as I say, in, in the year of her 70th birthday. I was so proud of her. What subject? Uh, in English, in English, um, which she continued to love. I mean, she should always love that. Um, so that's something about lifelong learning. So if any of you are thinking of coming back to lifelong learning, I can only say, do, please, you'll love it. Um, if you choose the right subject, and of course we all know what the right subject is, don't we? <laughs> um, I've also been asked to say something about the department, and to do that I'm going to tell you about Eileen. Um, Eileen, who won't thank me, I didn't tell her I was going to talk about her, and, and she'll see us on the podcast and she'll be horrified. Um, but she started coming here, actually I don't know how long ago, it must have been about 15 years ago, maybe not quite as long as that. Um, to start weekly classes in philosophy and she got hooked on philosophy rather as I did and she did weekly classes then she did the philosophy certificate course which, which sadly is now defunct but I'm hoping to get going again um, then she went on to Reading to do a, a master's degree and she's just submitted her PhD in philosophy at Reading University so to Eileen and I'm sure she'll get it because she's a very very good philosopher and that's coming to classes here but many years later, um, not, it doesn't take, it takes longer than five minutes to get a PhD. Okay, but we're really here to talk about philosophy. Um, so, the word means love of wisdom. And what's rather important is the first philosophers were the first people to search for natural as opposed to supernatural explanations. So, m most people were happy to just think that God... Um, did something is, is a perfectly good explanation. But the first philosophers, the pre-Socratics, um, were not happy with that sort of explanation. They would appeal to God in the final analysis if they really couldn't find any other explanation that would do. But first they would look for, for a natural explanation. Um, which is why the first philosophers were also the first scientists. Um, and um, many sciences started off being philosophy, and then as they became empirical, as you could actually test things, um, they hived off into their own discipline. Didn't mean, mean that um, philosophy became irrelevant, as we'll see. Um, so the subject matter of philosophy is everything. That's why it's so brilliant. Um, okay, it's everything, because if a human being can think about it, there is a philosophy of it. So there's a philosophy of minds, there's a philosophy of language, philosophy of science, philosophy of politics, philosophy of religion. And I could have carried on forever, but I ran out of PowerPoint slide. Um, so I've just got those on there. So um, let's have a look at some of these. Philosophy of minds, for example. Um, well, is the mental epiphenomenal? Um, 
So the mental to be epiphenomenal would be for it to have no causal power at all. And you, you might think, well, nonsense. Um, it's what I believe that causes me to do what I do. So it's because I believe that this person has very luminous gloves at the bottom of her feet, I'm going to say, would you pass me one? <laughs> so she's covered in books and things. <laughs> Uh, so she's passed me one, and I'm now showing you that it is indeed very luminous. So it was my desire to show you that, and my belief that I could do that by asking this person um, to, to give me a glass that caused me to do that. My actions are the result of my beliefs, and that's why we attribute, thank you, beliefs to each other all the time. What we're trying to do is understand each other's behaviours, understand what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it, what our reasons are for doing what we do. So our mental states are implicated in our behaviours. But if I wave at you now, um, you can explain that by I want to um, perform an action that I then say, well, how do you explain it? Okay, there's a desire and a belief there. But we all know that the, another explanation of my waving my hand uh, is neural. Um, if somebody knew enough about my brain, they'd be able to say, well, there's that neural state there that's causing that behavioral um, behavior there. Well, if you've got, um, this is why I needed the flip chart. So you've got one action, a hand waving, and two possible explanations, a neural explanation and a mental explanation. Well, that's problematic, isn't it? Why should we need two causes for something? Surely one of those must be, I mean, there, there are two possibilities, you might think. Either the neural state is the mental state, Okay, so that in fact there are not two explanations here, there's just one explanation of the same thing. Um, or one of these explanations just isn't the right one. And surely it's going to be the mental one. And some people think that because um, we will eventually find a neural explanation for all our behaviour, what that shows is that mental states are, either they don't exist at all, and that's metaphysics, which we're going to do next slide. Um, or, if they exist, they're epiphenomenal. So it's rather like the shadow. So my shadow has no causes or effects. Um, sorry, it has causes. It doesn't have effects. Um, I have effects, but my shadow doesn't. And so the, it, mental states would shadow neural states, but they don't themselves have effects. Now, philosophers want to say, well, okay, is, is that true, or, or is this true? Could it be that the mind is the very same thing as the brain? Um, and in that case, you've solved that problem. But there are big problems with that, and if anyone wants to see any more about those problems, they might look at my podcasts, and there'll be a reference to the podcast, of a romp through the nature of mind at the end of this unit. And in that I look at whether the mind is the same thing as the body and I look at all the problems for that because there are big problems for that. Um, and it's not obviously a question that science will be able to answer. Um, and I wish I could say something more about that now but we haven't time because we're going on to language. Okay, so, so that's a, a, just a feeling for what philosophy of mind is. Philosophy of language, now what's that? Okay, well, what is meaning? Um, here's, let's say, here's a word, mental. Okay, now you all know what that means. Or if I write on here, James is tall. Okay, you all understand that, don't you? Okay, that has meaning. Well, how can that squiggle on a board? How can my just using a pen to squiggle those things? How does that have meaning for you? And what about my saying, James is tall? All that is is sounds uh, crossing to your ear from my, uh, my mouth, I suppose. Um, how can that have meaning for you? And what is it to have meaning in the first place? What's the meaning of the word meaning? Here's why we might think that it's a bit difficult. If I say James is tall, you all understand that, don't you? Yeah? Okay. Um, so it has meaning, doesn't it? Can you tell me whether it's true or not? 
<laughs> well, well done, exactly so. Not without knowing who James is. Okay, so you know what this tool is. You don't need to know any more about that. You can tell it, but you, you need to know what the word James refers to or, or the sound James refers to. Um, okay, that's right. So there are two sorts of meaning, aren't there? Um, there's, there's, if you like, weak meaning, which is what you had there. You, you had something that looked like meaning. But actually, if you can't tell the truth value of a sentence, do you really understand the sentence? Until you know who James is, do you really understand this sentence? If not, then there's another sort of meaning. There's also strong meaning. So weak meaning is meaning without a context, if you like, and strong meaning is meaning with a context. And there's another reason for thinking that that uh, is important. So um, what's your name? Yes? Rupert. Rupert asks me, um, is he a good philosopher? And I say, his handwriting is excellent. <laughs> okay, what, have I, what is the meaning of what I've said there? Is it he's a good philosopher? No. Is it he's a bad philosopher? No. Isn't it? You might be inferring. I, I, I'm implying, <laughs> implying that he's, he's not a good philosopher, aren't I? And how do you know that? Because the meaning of the words that I used were completely irrelevant to the question I was asked, wasn't I? If I'm asked, was, is he a good philosopher? And I say his handwriting is excellent. Then it's the very fact that I used something with that weak meaning uh, in a completely irrelevant context that alerts you to the fact that this has a different meaning from the meaning you're expecting, from the meaning it would normally have. Um, another one, I mean, there are all sorts of things we can do, do with language. So, for example, um, if we think of this as the strict and literal truth conditions of a sentence, and then there's the um, force whether it's used to ask a question or, or to make a command or to make a statement or something. Uh, and then there's the tone we use. So how about, I'm not angry. <laughs> um, I mean, what I've said, the strict and literal truth conditions of what I said are, are contradicted by the tone in which I've said it, aren't they? Um, and then there's the context. So. Uh, what would happen if, um, what's your name? Gordon. 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 Um, say we'd been having a class every six weeks for a while, and, and he turns up every time Gordon's been late. Okay, so, so ten minutes into this class, the door crashes, Gordon comes in. And I say, hello, Gordon, early again. <laughs> um, what have I said? You're late, haven't I? So, so the context has, has reversed. What I've said, so many things that we can do with language, so many things we can do with meaning. Um, so, I mean, these are just, in each case, I put just a few of the questions that philosophers want to know. How can we do this? How can, how can we get this meaning? So it's the job of the linguist to study how language works empirically. But of course, as a linguist must work with the idea of meaning, um, that must be assumed by a linguist, uh, and in, again with the idea of reference. But it's the job of a philosopher to say, well, what is meaning? What's the meaning of the word meaning? Um, what is reference? How, how does a name, what's your name? George. George. How, how does the name George get attached to him? And probably, is there anyone else called George in this room? No, sod slow as you don't. And this is where I say, is anyone called John, thinking everybody around my age whose male is called John, is there? No, look at that, there isn't. Oh, yeah, there's one person. Okay, um, but let's move to science. Um, okay, uh, one question that a philosopher might, might ask. Okay, the, the question of whether science, uh, how science and philosophy differ is a very important one, because you'll have heard um, Stephen Hawking, for example, said recently, that um, philosophy is dead, he said. Philosophers haven't kept up. Um, philosophy is dead. Um, now, logic is something that philosophers study. And, of course, logic, uh, one type of argument in logic is arguments that come from authority. 
Um, so, so Stephen Hawking says P, therefore P. Uh, is that a good argument? No, why not? It is sometimes, isn't it? I mean, if Stephen Hawkins tells me that time travel is possible, I'm, I'm going to think, well, maybe time travel is possible. But if time, Stephen Hawkins says philosophy is dead, am I going to believe him? Answer, not necessarily, um, because, of course, he is an authority on physics, but not an authority on philosophy. Um, let's have a look at, OK, the paradoxes of confirmation. This is going to be good. Um, if I have a... Um, a generalization like all ravens are black. Okay, all ravens are black. That will have, will have come to that by saying one black raven, another black raven, another black raven. So we've seen so many black ravens, we think, okay, we'll extrapolate here, all ravens are black. Now, I see a, a black raven. Does that confirm, or, or a little bit confirm, all ravens are black? Uh, you say no, why not? Okay, uh, yes, but uh, that's why I said a little bit. I mean, it, it's not a falsification, is it? A white raven would be a falsification, but a, another black raven is just a tiny bit of confirmation. Um, because once you've got to the point where all ravens are black, um, every black raven you see is further confirmation of that theory, which is uninteresting, frankly. Um, who would think, well, it is, isn't it? I mean, if you've got to the stage where you make this generalization in the first place, you've seen so many black ravens that seeing another is uninteresting. Um, so confirming a generalization is, is nice, but not interesting. Actually, it's not nice because we'd much rather falsify it. But what about a white gym shoe? Would, would seeing a white gym shoe confirm all ravens are black? <laughs> Who thinks yes? <laughs> You're all wrong. Because <laughs> a white gym shoe does confirm all ravens are black, and this is why. All... <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, let me get the argument out, then, I, then disagree with me. Okay, all ravens are black is logically equivalent to um, all non-black things are non-ravens. Is that right? Um... Okay, what logical equivalence means is there is no situation where that's true, where that's not true. And there's no situation where that's true, where that's, that's not true. Okay? So who thinks that this isn't a logical equivalence? Come, come on, there's several of you. I'm, I'm dying to know why you think that's not a logical equivalence. Now look, you've all gone quiet. <laughs> The only situation I can think that that it wouldn't be is if you're using all ravens as, are black as a definition of what a raven is. If, it, if it's a, if well, it's even black, then, it would still be true, wouldn't it, that all non-black things are non-ravens? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, even that wouldn't. Um, yes. You see what he means. You could say that um, by definition, if it's not black, it's a, it's not a raven. Um, we usually think of discovering that ravens are black as something extra we learn about ravens rather than something that's part of the definition of ravens, uh, mainly because of albino ra ravens, which, of course... Like the odd white raven. Yes, we're, we're ignoring the odd white, <laughs> white raven. Okay, does anyone want to disagree with me that this is a logical equivalence? Other things could be black other than ravens. Yes, that's true, my boots are black. Um, but... Are they a non-black, non-raven? <laughs> no, because they're black. They are a non-raven. Um, but we're not, saying all, we're not saying all black things are ravens. We're saying all ravens are black. Got to get your Venn diagrams the right way around. The, the fact that a gym shoe happens... Ah, we haven't got onto the gym shoe yet. <laughs> well, this is a non-black thing. Yeah, you're right. And it's, you're, and it's a non-raven. 
You're absolutely right. Okay. But it does not prove that all ravens are black. Now let me continue because Gordon's got there first. Okay, if all ravens are black, it's logically equivalent to all non-black things are non-ravens. Then the sighting of a white gym shoe, which is, as Gordon says, a non-black, non-raven, if it confirms that, and this is logically equivalent to that, it ought to confirm that as well. So logic tells us that a white gym shoe does confirm all ravens are black. Now this is nonsense, isn't it? We, we all know that white gym sh the sighting of a white gym shoe does not confirm all ravens are black. So what's gone wrong here? Can anyone tell me what's gone wrong? You're trying to reverse the argument. Uh, no, the logic, believe me, really does work. Um, if you believe that that is logically equivalent to that, and you should because it is, <laughs> um, uh, well, there are certain things you ought to take on authority, and, and if we had longer, I would, I would convince you, but I can, I can, yeah. But actually, you don't need my authority to tell you that that, that and that are logically equivalent. You, you can see they are. No, what, no, hang on, I've got to draw it. Okay, I need somebody with arms. George, come up on stage. That's what you get for sitting in the front. <laughs> okay, all ravens are black. Um, here are all black things, and here are ravens. Right, what was your objection? So Marianne's boots are here. <laughs> no, and here are. Do you know nobody else is wearing boots? Yes, you are. What's your name? Susan. Okay. Oh, they're black. How annoying. Okay. What's your name? Emily. Emily. Emily's boots are brown. They're not black. Okay? So have I convinced you yes or not? Why not? I mean, what, what's the problem? Actually, you're going to have to move a bit over that way because you've got the... Um, that's it. Uh, there, there are other things, all of which are black. Coal. Coal, okay. Coal is here. Um, okay, this is the class of non-black things. Okay, so it's separate from the class of black things. Uh, Emily's boots are in here. Sorry, I've, I've run out of room to do my circles as I should, but you can see Emily's boots belong here. Okay, and white gym shoes belong here, don't they? Um, but all ravens are black, so in the class of all black things, you get all ravens. Are you convinced? Yes, okay. <sighs> right, now I've got what I was saying. Thank you. Oh, yes, I remember. Okay, so um, now this, I need you back. Okay, so this is logically equivalent to that. Therefore, logic tells us that a, the sighting of a white gym shoe confirms all ravens are black. Uh, we all want to say, nonsense. Uh, no chance, there's no way of the sighting of a gym shoe. Uh, so uh, what I asked you was, why not? What went wrong? Um, and I'll tell you what went wrong. Well, actually, you tell me. Was that a hand going up? Go on. Um, is it because one white gym not all non-black things, so it's just a point toward. No, um, no, because that—that's um, no, because if it was a white raven, it would be just one white thing, and it would completely blow this to smithereens, wouldn't it? If it was a white raven. Is it that logic only applies to part of its movements? Can you cash that out a little more? Well, 
Well, I'm thinking about um, probability. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that because there's such a vast number of things in the world, mm -hmm. then the implication of one of those things being a particular color, we just know, isn't going to imply that all that's that's the same. Yeah, I, okay, I, I can see you're getting tied up in your words, but you're absolutely on the right Is track. It, the color party from the individual to the, I mean, from something from one to all in general. No, because um, an, a, a, you're not making an assumption from one, you're seeing a white gym shoe, and so you're seeing a non-black, non-raven. So just as a, a, the sighting of one black raven would confirm this, so the sighting of one white gym shoe would confirm this, and therefore logically confirm that. But let's, one more and then we'll move on. Is it because uh, there are more things in the world than just ravens and gym shoes? Um, so, you know, if, if something is a gym shoe, it doesn't mean it's like the inverse of a raven. Um, you know, it could be, uh, okay, you're, you're also going in the right direction. What it shows us, so you're all shouting out now. <laughs> Good. Um, what it shows us is that in order to decide what would confirm all ravens are black, you are bringing to bear background knowledge of the world in which we live. Um, okay, if you were using only logic, um, you, you would agree that a white gym shoe would confirm all ravens are black. Um, but you're not using only logic, you're also bringing to bear your background's knowledge of the world. And what your background's knowledge tells you is that there are um, too many non-black, non-ravens. I don't know why I'm writing this, you can't read it and I can't either. <laughs> <laughs> there are too many non-black, non-ravens in the world for it to be interesting. Now imagine a, in the world, you know, there are ten things in the world. Apart from me, that is. Um, and nine of them are black. And nine of them are ravens. If I was in that world, the sighting of a bright gym shoe would make it quite uh, conclusive that all ravens are black, wouldn't it? Yeah. You're saying no. You know, at least you could have a black gym shoe and a white raven. No, not if nine of them are ravens and nine of them are black. If, if you see one white... Uh, nine of the things that exist are ravens, and nine of the things that exist are black. No, no, nine of them are black, and nine of them are ravens. So the sighting of a white gym shoe in this world would make it absolutely conclusive that all ravens are black. But the reason this is important, um, and, and I do this often with scientists, and they get just as irritated with me as you did, um, <laughs> Because what nurse has this got, what has white gym shoe got to do with it? What it's got to do with this is it draws our attention to the fact that actually we're always bringing to bear assumptions that we don't even notice when we decide um, what, to con what will confirm what or what th theory to um, postulate, what theory to test, how to test it, etc. And so what this does is it brings out the fact that we rely on all sorts of assumptions that we don't even notice. And, and it's perfectly reasonable to rely on that assumption here, but isn't it interesting we don't even notice it? And of course, sometimes the assumptions on which we rely are very important, and they turn out to be false. Okay, that's philosophy of science. I knew that would take ages. <laughs> um, politics. Okay, um, which principles should ground society? I mean, um, John Rawls, who's a very important uh, philosopher of politics, asks us to imagine what he calls the original position. And the original position is a position where um, none of us know who we are. We, our task is to choose the principles by which society to, should be run, whether it should be equality, whether it should be utilitarianism, whether it should be deontology, etc., etc. Okay, you may not know what these things are, but just bear with me for the moment. Um, but 
In the original position, what we don't know is who we are, or indeed anything about ourselves. So we don't know whether we're male or female. We don't know whether we're old or young. We don't know whether we're rich or poor. We don't know whether we're tall or short. Um, you get the idea. So we're behind what he calls the veil of ignorance. Um, and um, we, what we do have, we do have some knowledge. We have the thin theory of good. And the thin theory of good tells us some physiological, psychological, um, political facts about human beings. So for example, we know that uh, it's f human females who have babies, not human males. We know that the gestation period is nine months. We know things like that, but we don't know whether we ourselves are female or, or male. Now, why would that be a good position from which to decide on the principles of justice? Can anyone tell me? You can't load the dice in your favor. That's so nicely put. <laughs> you can't load the dice in your favor. You, you can't say, well, I'm a man. We don't, we can, all women should be at home by nine o'clock at night cooking the meal. <laughs> Six o'clock at night, what do I mean nine o'clock at night? <laughs> um, because, because I'm male, I think that. I think, actually, I might be female. Um, there, uh, would I want that? No, I wouldn't want that, therefore. So we can't load the dice in our favour. That's exactly what the, the veil of ignorance and the thin theory of good and the original position are for. All sorts of problems with that, and it would be lovely to tell you about them, but we haven't got time. Um, so what about the, the um, conflict between justice and equality? Um, this was a thought experiment done by a chap called Robert Nozick, who's another very important political philosopher. Um, he asks us to uh, think about a chap called Wilt, or is it Wilt? Chamberlain. Wilt Chamberlain. Apparently he was a basketball player. Is that right? You're, you're Canadian, you ought to know. <laughs> um, okay, so Wilt Chamberlain is a brilliant basketball player. We all love to see, I mean, we may hate sport the rest of the time, but we really want to see Wilt Chamberlain play. And we're prepared to, to each of us give him 25 cents to play. As a result, for him to play rather, um, as a result, Wilt gets extremely rich. Um, we're all quite poor, um, but Wilt gets extremely rich. Um, now, the only way we can make us equal again is by restricting freedom in some way. So we can either restrict your freedom to give Wilt 25 cents of your money to see him play, but you might think, well, hang on, that's, that's a bit annoying. I want to see him play. I think he's worth 25 cents. Or we can say to Wilt, okay, you can take all this money, but you've got to give quite a lot of it back, um, so redistributing wealth. But that's to restrict Wilt's freedom to spend the money he has earned as he chooses. Um, and so the only way we, we can get equality is by restricting freedom. And the only way we can get freedom is by allowing inequality. That's what the Wilt Chamberlain argument is supposed to do. So those of us who want both freedom and equality within a society have immediately got a problem. And what are we going to do with that problem? Sadly, we don't have time to think about it right now. But this is what you would do if you're thinking about philosophy. OK, religion, the big one. Um, OK, th this is, um, if God exists, why is there so much evil with the, in the world? You all have heard of this, the, the problem of free will. The problem of free will is God is omnipotent. He, he can do everything. If he's omniscient, he knows everything. And if he's omnibenevolent, he, he wants everything to be good for us all, then how come there is so much evil in the world? I mean, God could stop it. He's omnipotent. He knows about it. It's not that it's gone past his radar. Um, he, he knows about it. He's omniscient, for goodness sake. And it's not that he doesn't want to do anything about it, because he's omnibenevolent. So, he should. so how come there is evil in the world? Um, the traditional answer is, is uh, that's why we've got free will, because it's better that we have free will um, and evil, because we choose to do evil, um, than it is um, to 
not have free will, in which case there wouldn't be any bad in the world, but nor would there be any good in the world. And one of the things I like to do with students here is ask them to engage in a thought experiment. If you were God, you couldn't create a world in which there's only good or only evil. If you create good, you have to create the possibility of evil. Okay, because you have to create free will, you have to create choice. Okay, would you choose not to create a world at all, or rather perhaps to create a world with no good or evil, or would you choose to create a world in which there's both good and evil? I'm going to leave you with that one. <laughs> you can stay awake tonight worrying about that one. There's a course about it in the OECD. There's a what? There's a course about it. Oh, there, are all, there are courses about all the things I'm talking about, often by me. <laughs> okay, so just going back to other, what I've said is that the, the subject matter of philosophy is everything. There's nothing a human being can think about that, that a philosopher isn't interested in thinking about the thinking about it. Um, uh, that's what we do. And I've given you some examples there. But if there's any subject matter that can be said to be peculiarly the province of philosophy, um, it's these four. Uh, logic, ethics, metaphysics, and epistemology. And when I say logic is peculiarly the province of philosophy, of course it's not. It's also the province of maths. Um, but maths and philosophers, and now computer scientists, who I suppose I'm counting as mathematicians in a way, possibly unfairly, um, actually study logic. Uh, it's only in philosophy and maths in universities and computer science that logic is studied. Um, and what we study is what is an argument? Which arguments are good? Which arguments are bad? Are there different types of arguments? What are the laws of logic? Um, uh, I can ask you a question about that. One thing that's assumed or for, how, for has for many, many years has been assumed to be a law of logic, is the law of excluded middle, which says either P is true or not P is true. So P or not P is always and everywhere true. Um, and quantum mechanics has called that, called that into question um, over the last century, uh, which of course is interesting. Could there be a, an empirical uh, objection to a law of logic. That's, that's a very interesting one. Um, but here's a, a rather easier example. Um, your jacket there, let me take it, is... Fame at last. <laughs> Fame at last, she says. Actually, it's not quite going to work for my... It's not not red, is it? It, well, unfortunately, it is not red. You're quite right. <laughs> Do you see if it were a different colour? I could say it's not not red. And isn't that already, thank you, a counterexample to the law of excluded middle? If something's not not red, then it's neither P nor not P, isn't it? Do you see? We're, so we didn't need to wait for quantum mechanics. Surely we could just say. Uh, and here's another example. That little kitten on the floor there, is it black? <laughs> Mouse! <laughs> you, you can't answer that, but what I've said, the little kitten on the floor is black, is neither true nor false, is it? I, do you think it's straightforwardly false that the little kitten is black? Not really. Because if you say it's false, you're sort of implying there is a kitten there, but it's ginger. <laughs> um, so the laws, what the laws of logic are is still a live issue. There are lots of different types of logic. And classical logic, which is the one that, that um, says the law of excluded middle um, is a law of logic, is, is only one type of logic. Um, ethics, of course, is, is a very big one. Is moral truth absolute or relative? Um, well, lots of people think it's relative. Um, does anyone here think that moral truth is relative? Can anyone tell me why? Um, okay, different generations have different moral beliefs. Okay, and different cultures have different moral beliefs. Okay, so um, moral truth is relative 
to a culture at the back and moral truth is relative to a generation or time perhaps um, at the front here. Um, Okay, or you could say moral truth is relative to an individual. You believe that abortion is, is right and I think it's wrong or, or something like that. Um, surely the fact that different people have different beliefs is reason to believe that moral truth is relative. But is it? Um, if I have a, a two genetically identical seeds and I put one of them in John Innes number three compost, water it nicely, talk to it, give it a pat every now and again, um, put it somewhere where it's going to get the sun. And the other one I put in nasty garden soil and I stick it in the air in cupboard and forget about it. I give it enough water to keep it alive, but that's all. Are they going to look similar no. after six weeks? They're not, are they? Um, they're going to look very different. Okay, is the fact that the phenotype is different evidence for their not having the same genotype? No, it isn't, is it? Because the environment counts as well. And might we not think that the same thing is true with morality in some cases? So, for example, the, the, uh, we keep our elderly alive as long as possible. The Inuit at least used to put them gently to death. Might that not be explained by the fact that we both respect the elderly, um, but in their environment, respecting the elderly is, is to let them die? whereas in our environment it isn't. Alternatively, one of us could be wrong. And, and I wouldn't like to say who it is in this case, um, but one of us could be wrong. And so the fact that there are differences in moral beliefs amongst cultures or generations or, or even individuals is actually not in itself sufficient to say that morality is relative. Okay, metaphysics. Um, metaphysics is, is to do with... Uh, I mean, this is the most general. Metaphysics means before physics. Um, what is, what exists? So all of you in this room have an ontology. Some of you believe in ghosts, some of you believe in fairies, and others don't. Those who believe in fairies have an ontology, a list of what exists on what, which fairies feature. Um, some, some people would say that moral values exist. Um, other people will say, well, what are they? They're queer sort of things. If they do exist, perhaps they don't exist. Um, but if we model everything on physical objects, things you can touch or kick or put into your pocket or something, then moral values do look very odd, don't they? So metaphysics asks, well, what does exist? Do mental states exist? Do, um, does truth exist? Um, and all, the second question that metaphysics asks is, what is the nature of what exists. So if physical objects exist, what is their nature? Are they, as Berkeley said, cons constituted of nothing more than actual or counterfactual um, perceptions? Or are they, as Locke thought, um, real mind-independent, um, three-dimensional, solid things, which is what we all think until we read Berkeley, then we don't know what to think. Um, <laughs> I haven't got time to ask you what truth is, which is a shame. So I'll send you home thinking, asking yourself what truth is. And epistemology is what can we know? What is knowledge? How can we justify claims to know something? Did you know that if you know something, the something you know can't be false? We can't know something false. Does anyone disagree with that? Wait till someone disagrees with it and I'll tell you. Can we not know that something is false? Oh, we can know something is false. Yes, that's right, because then it's true that it's false, isn't it? But we can't know something false. Like someone's age, they tell you they're such an age and you, you know they're 50 and they're really 60. Okay, they, they tell you that they're 50, so you believe they're 50. But do you know that they're 50? You don't. We can believe that we know something false. We can't know something false. If it's false, we can't know it. Because knowledge is factive, um, which means nothing more than you can't know something false. Perception is also factive. I can't perceive something that doesn't exist. 
When Macbeth thought that he could perceive the dagger in front of him, he was wrong. He was hallucinating the dagger in front of him. He believed he could see it. He couldn't see it because there wasn't a dagger. Um, so perception is factive, knowledge is factive. Okay, so that, that's a romp through philosophy in 45 minutes. And I hope I've convinced you this is the best subject in the world, because it is. I mean, that's just true. <laughs> um, and where to go from here? Um, well, OEDC, you know where we are now. Um, I hope you come again. There are weekly classes in philosophy. There's this newspaper which will tell you all about it. We've got things on um, thought experiments in philosophy, an introduction in philosophy of science, philosophy of maths for beginners, uh, applied ethics, aesthetics, creativity, imagination, and fiction. Just a few of the weekly classes we've got. We've also got weekend schools. Uh, I've been doing an introduction to critical reasoning, but that's finished, sadly. But there will be a podcast. Um, Anti-realism, what is it and should we believe it? Artificial intelligence coming up. Philosophy in the weekend, I'm doing that with a chap called Nigel Warburton. Philosophy of the family. I told you we can think about everything. <laughs> Language and its pragmatics. Philosophy and literature and an introduction to the mind-body problem, which I'm doing in Newbury in June. Um, there are also summer schools, and I forgot to bring them prospectus, so I have no idea what we're doing there. Um, and there are lots of online courses. The online courses that we do are um, ethics, philosophy, introductions to philosophy, mind, bioethics, religion, theory of knowledge, introduction to metaphysics, philosophy of science, they're 10-week short courses, and they're really good. I really recommend them. That's the Philosophical Society. We have got 280, 284 members, and you'd be most welcome to come. Uh, Oxford University Philosophy Podcasts, including my podcasts. And that's my website. That's my Twitter feed. Hope you're all going to follow me. Um, that's my Facebook page. You can like it, which would be very kind of you. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.